Always love talking Liberty University football with Chris Lang, one of the most informative people about the Flames. He covers the beat for the news in advance. Chris joined me to review the game against Montana. We talk about Lehigh and touch on a little bit more. Liberty Flames talk on the football field with Chris Lang on the Sports Buffet podcast. I started the Sports Buffet podcast. One of the reasons I started it is just so I could talk to Chris Lang uh, often about Liberty football. Always love to have Chris on to talk some flames and uh chris you've got the uh pleasure of experiencing the long trip out to montana last week but i take it back from your uh, big sky days you might have hit the uh state of montana maybe once i live in a few times i've been in missouri i've been to bozeman uh, mostly for basketball that was my first time catching a football game up there and it was uh, it lived up to the height in terms of the crowd noise and the tailgating scene and that's just the way that everybody in the town you tend to it just a bunch of really good knowledgeable FCS football fans. It was, it was a lot of fun just to go up there and mingle with the people on Friday night and, and hang out. And, and uh, then the game itself on Saturday was fantastic as well. So it was, it, was, it was a fun experience all around for sure. Liberty doesn't get the result they wanted, but let's start with the good. What good can they take out of last Saturday's affair? Well, they saw what they had in Josh Wickham, uh, the, the, the retro freshman quarterback from Cape Spring and Roanoke. He, uh, you know, he didn't really get a fair shake in that Wake Forest game. Um, uh, he, he got two series where he was backed up against his goal line, uh, offensive line penalties, and, and nobody's going to excel in those situations. So um, he had to play on Saturday. He was poised uh, for, for most of the game. Granted, they didn't really go to the downfield game a whole lot just because what Montana was giving them was that short screen passing game. Um, he made the one bad mistake uh, on, the, on the interception that cost him a touchdown, which uh, uh, it, which is something he'll certainly learn from. He kind of went asked about it this week, kind of rolled his eyes a little bit like, hey, I know I made a really bad throw there and, and made a bad decision. And, and uh, But he bounced back from that. It, that happened in the second quarter when everything was going wrong for them. And he managed to come back, lead a couple touchdown drives in the second half. And then, so going forward, you know, that, that would be a very difficult game to win anyways. There's a reason why only one non-conference team has won a game there in the last 12 years in the regular season. At least a couple playoff teams have gone up there and won. But uh, uh, it, 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 you, have to, you have to look at the big picture with this team right now. But if they are only three, but um, certainly, you, you got to take the positives because they're, they're not playing the same schedule they played in those six when they're playing St. Paul, Glenville State, Savannah State, people like that. And this is this is a, a good test all around for them. With Josh Woodrum's play at quarterback, and I know he's filling in, I believe, uh, because of injury. Uh, is it a quarterback controversy, or how, how's that working? Yeah, it's a, it's a quarterback battle again. You know, I asked the Turner after the game. I said, "Well, is this, is this thing back open again?" And he says, "Oh, yeah." So, and, and when we talked to him yesterday uh, after practice, he still had made a decision. He was going to go look at more, more film from practice uh, and, and tell the guys uh, on Friday, or today, I suppose, uh, who was going to start the Lehigh game. So we probably won't know that uh, because no, nobody in the media has access on Friday. We'll know that until game time tomorrow. So we'll see uh, who's out there warming up. Uh, you know, I, know, I know he said he didn't want Brian Hudson to lose his job because of injury. And that's admirable, but at the same time, we're not talking about a long time in trench starter. The guy started two games. So, um, you know, if, if, if whoever gives him the best chance to win, I think it's what he's going to go with is because uh, as much as you can talk about the test schedule and everything, that this is a team that really desperately needs to have a positive, good feeling going into the, the bye week and the starter conference play. If you had to put your Monopoly money down on who starts on Saturday night, who is it? I would guess Woodrum. I, I just I, I liked way too much about what I saw from him on Saturday, uh, more so than, than than Hudson, who really you know he looked good in the Wake Forest game, but uh, at the same time you look at Hudson's last two quarters of Wake Forest and the first uh, three quarters um, that, that he played against Norfolk State, and he really didn't do a whole lot in terms of, of leading the offense, marching them up and down the field. I, I just I, Woodrum, uh, he was able to make some of the deep throws. I thought that that touchdown pass to Ryan Ferguson was huge. It, it was inconsequential in the grand scheme of the game. It made it from 31-7 to, to 31-14, but at the same time, they needed to be able to show that there was some chemistry to be able to just throw a ball up there and have Ryan Ferguson run underneath it to grab it. So, um, hot touch and uh, it's, it's, it's a tough call, but I'm, I'm just going to guess what While we're on the offense, let's stay on the topic. We talked about the good. What uh, comes out of the offense that either A, can be viewed as a disappointment, or B, it's just not, not good showing for the offense on uh, Saturday? Last well, the offensive line, and that's understandable. You lose Malcolm Boyd, uh, who's an All-American candidate, uh, or was an All-American last season at left guard for the year with a broken leg, and that just that, that screwed everything up. Uh, yeah, Greg Ray is a, is, a, is a decent fill-in. The problem is he's a guy that's used to coming in and playing 
20, 25 snaps, rotating at, at the two guard positions. Now he's got to start. Uh, it, it's going to take a while for his condition to get up there. He's not nearly as athletic as Boyd is in terms of, of uh, running some of the, the pulls and things that they do in the run game. So uh, Jay Weatherington was, was starting the season at center, um, but then he had the ruptured eardrum that made him miss all training camp. He's working slowly back in there, so those two are kind of working at left guard right now. And Aaron Lundy is, uh, is, is kind of sticking around at center for the time being, at least until the bye week starts. So it may take a couple of weeks for that to get together, but they really don't have any depth there now. They're, they're down to really six guys that can play. Um, it, it, I was expecting Aaron Campbell at some point, the redshirt freshman, to come in and be able to do something, but they don't seem to, to have any confidence in him because he's yet to play. They've already said Grant Jones is going to redshirt, and I doubt they're going to go against that. And uh, you know they lose Kevin Widener, uh, who quit the team. So... Uh, the offensive line is going to be an issue, I think, going forward. But at the same time, I, I don't think they're going to see uh, any more defensive fronts like they saw between Wake Forest and, and Montana. And the, those were by far the best that they're going to see. Montana was just all over them in that game. And um, tough assignment for that offensive line. And then you look at the run game, too. Um, and that's a product of the offensive line, obviously. Right. Uh, they, they, they didn't. Uh, Aldrich Allen just didn't look like he had the burst that I was accustomed to seeing from him at Montana. So. Uh, I think he, he'll be in store for a bounce that game here on Saturday. And, uh, they, they really need to be able to get some between the tackles running going. Well, let's stay on the topic of the offensive line for a moment. I think guys can get frustrated when they don't get blocks, whether it be the quarterback, the running back, and you know even the receivers, because if the line's not giving the quarterback time to throw, the receivers are not going to get open or whatnot. Can the uh, ineffectiveness of the line lead to uh, you know finger pointing, or does the coaching staff have it uh, well enough to where you know guys, we just got we're going to get better. It's going to take a little bit of time, but just be patient. Yeah, I think they understand the patience factor. I, I, I don't think there's anybody on that offense that, that underestimates the value of Malcolm Boyd, the guy that started for, for three years at left guard and really, was really the anchor of that line. So I, I, to go into that environment where um, all apologies to Wake Forest, it was you know three times the home field advantage of Wake Forest. It was loud in there. Um, it, 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 it took time for, you know, Joshua, you, so you've got a, a new offensive line, you got a new starting quarterback who's trying to, run up to the line of scrimmage and, and, and make calls by you know yelling into their ears because you can't make the calls from, from back in the shot from where he wants to. And it's going to lead to some confusion. And I, I just think they understand it's going to take time. And, and if if this continues into you know the Concord game, the Coastal Carolina game at the end of October, and the offensive line is still just struggling to do anything, then, yeah, you might see some of that. But I think the, the players are smart enough to get it that, that last week was a really, really tough assignment for a for that group to, to try to pull it together. Before we head to the defense, and I, I don't like to talk recruiting uh, normally so much because obviously you're focused on a beat right now, but uh, for 2013, is that Turner's biggest, uh, re- I don't want to say responsibility is not the word, but biggest priority of shoring up the offensive line with recruiting, or is it another position that really needs the help in terms of uh, getting impact guys in? Well, I think... The- you know, offensive line is one of them. Um, re- receiver is going to be a spot because, again, he, even the fill-in guys that they've picked up this year were who have been elevated up to depth chart line for Ursa and Elliot Dutra. They're seniors, so and Pat Kelly's a senior, so you're going to lose three more pretty good receivers. They've got some guys in the pipeline that are really young, um, Demarcus Saison, uh, Darren Peterson, uh, guys that haven't seen a whole lot of game action this year because they're true freshmen. But uh, you know, I think receiver is going to be a spot uh, too that they're really going to look at. And, and I, you know, I wonder what kind of uh, and they got some running backs in the pipeline, too, so I think you're right. Offensive line and receiver will probably be the, the two places that they're trying to, to add some bulk. They've got some guys in the system that uh, that are really young, but as you know, um, the offensive line, it's really tough to come in and play as a freshman or, or even as a sophomore. A lot of, a lot of times at this level, you, you get uh, you get two-year starters there, guys that, that, that really need those two years in the weight room and the conditioning to get into college shape because the, the difference between being a high school offensive line and where they basically just say, Get up there, eat, and block. Right. Uh, the, the athletes are so much better at this level. It's it's so much more of a nuanced game where they run so many more different, complicated offenses that uh, it just takes that. That's the position that takes a long time for guys to to get accustomed to. Even the biggest, best blue chip recruits, you don't see a lot of true freshmen and redshirt freshmen starting at the BCS program from the offensive line either. Defense uh, pros. Well, pros is that they they <laughs> they help Montana down to three hundred yards in their home field. And, and the biggest pro was the fact that that uh, Montana got absolutely nothing downfield, nothing. Uh, there, I, don't, I can't remember a pass to a wide receiver that went that longer than five yards. And while they can, Kevin Fogg are, are absolutely as advertised at that, at that corner position. And Montana, it's not like they didn't try. I, I know the strength of Montana's offense, their run game, and they, they did run the ball pretty decently well. 
Cons defensively. I didn't see a whole lot. Yeah, you know, the tackling was really good. They, they, they gave up a couple of, of big plays, but uh, really they only gave up the one big play that was just some, was a, a complete and blown assignment on, on the uh, Dan Moore 32 yard touchdown where it looked like he just <laughs> ran completely out there, stuck the middle on his own play. That was really well blocked by Montana. Again, that's that's a play that's set up by a turnover. Um, so, but for the most part, it, it, it's hard to find a lot of a lot of cons in the old Montana. To, it's a team that would, had racked up 600 yards at home against South Dakota State, close to 600 yards at Appalachian State. At the end of the third quarter, they had 161 on their home field. So I think they were a little befuddled why they could move the football. Lehigh is the opponent on Saturday night. They are nationally ranked coming into Williams Stadium. Uh, give me the scouting report on Lehigh and what type of team the Flames are going to be seeing across the field. Well, it's a team that's uh, been the best team in the Patriot League for the last couple of years. They went to the quarterfinals of the playoffs last year for North Dakota State and uh, lost that game, but uh, so did everybody else who played North Dakota State in the playoffs. They won the championship, so no, no shame in that. Um, a good program. They are 3-0 this year uh, with wins over uh, Monmouth, Central Connecticut State, and Princeton, so they really haven't played a, a, a really difficult schedule. Um, and, and even Andy Cohen, their coach, admits that they haven't faced a real road test check in Central Connecticut at noon is not the same as playing Liberty at 7 p.m. Um, it's going to be interesting because they, they, they only play one night game a year, and, and their guys get jacked up for it. You know, football players love playing under the lights, and so, so they're going to be really hyped to come in and play in this environment. I think it's, it's going to be fun all around. Uh, they, they're replacing their, uh, their quarterback, Chris Long, from last year. Michael Colvin's okay. He's not the same guy. He's, he's only got three touchdowns and four interceptions in the first three games, and there's been some frustration up there from, from Ryan Spadola, the All-American wide receiver, saying, hey, this offense needs to start hitting. The, the way it needs to. So Colvin's the guy that runs the ball a little bit. Big guy. Uh, they'll run a lot of draws and options and things like that for him. But, uh, but you know, uh, if we I can't get their downfield passing game going, I think it's going to be a tough. Oh, and three are the Flames as they come into this. And I know, you know, obviously living in Lynchburg, you know, when Coastal comes to town, they've always got to beat Coastal in the, you know, sea of red and everything. What is the environment you expect on Saturday night? I mean, in terms of, you know, is it going to be an average Liberty environment, or is this such a game that it's going to be, you know, bring out your cowbells and, you know, sinks and everything else you have because we're in it to win it on this one? I think it's going to be a good environment. First of all, the weather's supposed to be great. I think it's supposed to be around 80 degrees at kickoff, which is just perfect football weather. Um, you you got to... There's enough still excitement around over this team. I, I'll give the fan base credit. I don't think they've, they've completely. I know that the players haven't given up, but I think they, they understand too that it's, it's been drilled into them. It's a tough schedule. This is New York. Uh, this 0 3 may be better than, than some of the 3 and 0s the, that they've had in the past. So, uh, you know, it's also college for a weekend there, so that used to draw the crowd. I, I think it'll be a pretty good pass, especially if it's not going to be another home game for a couple of weeks. So. Um, I'm expecting a pretty good environment. It's the last night game of the year, too, and that, that usually uh, votes for good things because people can get out and tailgate all afternoon and, and, and you know, get filled up on good food and, and family and friends on and come out and watch football games. So I expect good things. Keys to the game to give Liberty a victory. Uh, I'll let you uh, give me as many as you like. Well, number one, you got yeah, you got to tighten up on special teams. Uh, what, what happened the last two weeks with the punt returns was atrocious. That, uh, I mean, I'm and give Peter Wynn plenty of credit for Montana for making that, that kick return, but it should have never happened. They, they over-pursued on the kick. The kick was too high to begin with. It was uh, so, the, so the return team over-pursued. They got behind New and He only had two or three guys to beat. Grant Bowden's a punter, and, and he, he had New and teetering on the sideline. Andrew Yow completely misses on a tackle, and two other guys missed afterwards. There's just no way he should have gotten into the end zone. And I think if they stopped him at the 30, the way their defense was playing, Pretty good chance they get out of there only giving up three points. So that that was they, they also gave up a punt return against Norfolk State. Mike Benner, their special teams coordinator, told me that uh, you know one of the things too is is that it's got to get better at angling his punts, putting it one one place or the other, not putting it in the middle of the field because you put it in the middle and the, and the returner's got way too many options at that point. You know, he, can, he can go any number of different ways, but but tuck it along one of those sidelines and and uh, he, he's only got one place to go and the return coverage can, can be that much stronger. So that would be, certainly be a thing to watch this week is the punt return coverage. And, and Lehigh's had some itch punt returns. They had a guy muffed two of them last week against Princeton. He's been replaced by somebody else. So that's going to be a big area of the game. Second key, like I said, is uh, the downfield passing games for Lehigh. If 
they let Ryan Spadola get going and, and get into those eight, nine, ten catch range and, and get hot, it's it's going to be tough. I mean, if they can limit him to, to shorter patterns and tackle, and they tackle well at Montana, uh, that the, they'll be okay there. They just can't get up the deep ball, and I, I don't see. I just, I just the, the way that Aiken and Florida are playing, they're playing at such a high level that uh, that, that that's going to be tough for Lehigh to get that going. And then the third one is the Liberty's got to start fast because Lehigh has been really good in the first half. Can't remember the number off the top of my head, but I think they've outscored their opponents like fifty-eight to seven or fifty-four to seven, something in that range in the first half. So can't let Lehigh get up ten nothing in this game because. You know, if that happens, you're looking at a team with a that's you know, 0-3 and going, okay, now we're down again and this and that. So they, they need to get off to a good start, uh, get on the board early, and uh, move move the ball, get a couple stops defense, and, and keep the home crowd in the game. Final thing for you, Chris. Always love uh, catching up with you. We'll catch up again soon. Uh, you talk about the tough schedule, and I get that, but uh, Turner Gill, you know, I don't know him pretty much from Adam, but I'm guessing he's not really – a ton of uh, big guy into moral victories. This team wants to win at some point. Is this a must-win game yet, or I mean, are we getting into that uh, realm just in terms of you know giving the guys a little more confidence? Because it's always better to put one on the uh, left side of the column than it is the right side. Yeah, it's getting there, especially with with the bye week coming up and conference play starting, and you're going to be playing a team in a similar situation. Gardner Webb is going up to Pittsburgh this week. They're going to lose um, probably heavily. So, so they're going to be all in four coming into that. Uh, they also have a bye week next week, hitting the conference opener on October 6th here at Lynchburg. So, yeah, you want, you want to have, going into a bye week, you can't sit there at all in four. You want to have your guys have a good feeling. Um, and and at, at some point, you have to have some validation that all the work you're doing is going to pay off in some, some realm. And, and it's one thing to say after three weeks to, to, to continue and say, you know, hey, uh, you know, we're, we're two plays away, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're right there. And, and let's be honest, best case scenario, this team was going to be one and two anyways after those games. Right. Nobody expected them to be Montana or Wake Forest on the road. So, yeah, this is, this, this falls into the must win territory. They, they just got to get some confidence. Gil himself hasn't won a game in a long time. He's lost 13 straight games. He lost his last 10 at Kansas. So, yeah, I, I think at, at some point he's got to have a good feeling to, to, to I'm not sure he wouldn't admit that out loud, but uh, <laughs> just I, I think it's got to be tough on him. What's going on? So, right, you'll, yeah, you'll admit it for him. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 need, they do need this one badly because it's, uh, you, you also want to just re- remind your team that the home field advantage does mean something, and, and, and it, it should. They, they only lost by three points on the road last year at Lehigh, and that's a team that went to the quarterfinals. So, what? Uh, this is a game that they, they certainly feel like they should win. Actually, I kind of lied. Before we get out, uh, what else is sticking out to you right now about the Big South? About the Big South, um, it really not much has changed. I mean, the Stony Brook Coastal Carolina, I think. Uh, Stony Brook's pretty good. Liberty and Coastal are, are kind of in the mix of, uh, of being you know, decent teams that uh, uh, can, be, can be good and can compete for the conference championship. The other four teams just look awful. Gardner Webb looks, I'm really disappointed in them. I thought they were going to be a lot better than they had been, but. Uh, they can't stop anybody. Uh, they, they finally started to score last week against Stanford, but it was well too late. It was deep in the game when Stanford had their, their reserves in the game. Um, Charleston Southern just is, is atrocious. BMI, <laughs> they're, they're still bad. They're going to get rocked again this week at Navy. The only wins a comfortable behind win over D2 Shawan. And then uh, Presbyterian, I'm curious to see what the real Presbyterian is because they beat the the tall out of Division Two Brevard at home, and then they went off and just got humiliated at Georgia Tech and Vanderbilt. I know, I know you're not supposed to win those games, but I don't think you're supposed to lose them 117 to three either. So, uh, PC, I, I thought was going to be better. They're playing firm at home this week. I think we'll get a pretty good read on on where they are. And uh, you know, Liberty's first two conference games are Gardner Webb and Presbyterian, so those will. Um, I think the fans should definitely be interested in the PC firm game just to kind of get a real read of the Blue Hawks because. They're probably better than what they've uh, shown the last couple weeks. But without a doubt, Stony Brook is still the uh, head and shoulders that's still their conference to lose? I think so. You know, they had, they, they left Syracuse in the third quarter last week in the road, and then kind of Syracuse's offense took over a little bit. And, uh, they, they've developed a little bit of a downfield passing game, which they didn't have last year with uh, Kevin Harrell, and, uh, the wide receiver, and, and Tyler Essington, the quarterback. The running backs are as good as advertised. Uh, it's it, it, it's certainly their league to lose, and they'll they'll have another interesting test. They play Colgate this week at home, which they should win. Then they go across the Hudson River to go play Army next week, which.
which that would be an interesting game because I, I think they can certainly compete in that one. I bet it should be a big game to see like running backs. Because, uh, I know Harvey likes to run the football a little bit. That Stony Brook does too, so that would be fun to watch. Chris, as always, love the time. We'll get you on soon to talk about the Baltimore Orioles because they are just like uh, in-laws. They will not go away. They, they, they won't right now. I mean, they get, uh, I'm in a little sleep this week because they keep playing these extra inning games in Seattle. I'm glad they're back in the East Coast. Yeah, absolutely. Chris Lang on the Sports Buffet Podcast. All right, thanks, Bob.